this morning's invocation. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to gather today to worship in your name. We thank you for your presence and for that of the Holy Spirit. We're here to worship, so come Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts, fill this building. We give you the honor and the glory and offer our worship time to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let us all join together in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, hello. There it's coming. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy that everyone is here on this beautiful morning. The weather's been great the last few days, and God, we thank you for that. That heat had had enough for us. Next week, Bob Pruitt of the Gideons is coming uh, to give the annual report on the Gideons and how they're doing. We support them every year, so I hope that everyone will come out and give support not only to them as we do financially, but also to support them by being here. And Bob will be doing a couple songs, I guess. And uh, will be giving us an update on things and speaking to you. Um, Anna is away next Sunday, so I hope that everyone on the tech table will plan to be here so that all those spaces are filled and she won't need to be worried about it while she's gone on vacation. We are scheduled to have a council meeting at 6 o'clock tomorrow, and I'd like to talk to the council members after the uh, service today and of course Wednesdays we have been kind of off and on this summer so uh, I'm still planning to continue with it we've just had some things get in the way of our the heat for one um, of our prayer time and Bible study any other announcements this morning well it is birthday Sunday and I always look forward to that because I love singing our happy birthday song and because I love the brunch after, after uh, our service. So our birthday people today are Jasper Ellis, uh, which is our granddaughter, Jean DeGara, who um, attends online every now and again and uh, has come to our Bible study in the past, Brandon Haley, and Ronald Mack, Adrian's dad. So, and it's also Pam and Charlie's 40th wedding anniversary. It's, yes. So they're up at Hampton. What? Brianna Gallant. Brianna Gallant. Okay. What's that? Oh, my daughter in law. July. Brianna? Okay. The Gallant threw me off. <laughs> Who is very pregnant and is supposed to be delivering within the next four days, I think, for um, our second little grandchild. So um, Alexander will be his name. So, let, uh, so Pam and Charlie are away. They're up at Hampton Beach, which is where they sp apparently spent their honeymoon. And... Uh, Pam is definitely a beach person. So let's have our birthday song. Happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you have Jesus near every day of the year. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and the best you have ever had. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, 
day you have Jesus near Every day of the year Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you And the best you have ever had Happy birthday! Okay, no other announcements this morning. So let us go with our voices and our songs to this week's praise time. Sing to my sin anymore. 
Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinners as the heart.
so thankful that your grace covers us. That, Lord, we are made new. We are made complete by your grace. And we just thank you for your love that goes along with that grace, for your sacrifice to bring us into your family, to bring us into your kingdom. And we have so many things to be thankful for. And Lord, especially just in my personal family, I am so thankful for all of my children. And I just pray for a safe delivery for my grandson, Alexander, who's due in three short days. And I just pray for them, especially because they're buying a house and closing and moving and having a baby all within a few short weeks' time. So we just pray for your strength and your grace to cover them. And I do pray for safe traveling for Peggy, who's going on vacation to Colorado, and for my daughter and myself, as we also travel to Colorado, to the same town as Peggy. And Lord, we just pray for all of those that are be on the roads, that will be in the air, that will be traveling. Um, it was kind of scary last week when people couldn't fly because of the because of everything being shut down. And Lord, we just pray that everything is back up and running worldwide with no glitches, and that we can resume normal normal life. Lord, we just pray for. Barbara, and we pray for Charlie, and we pray for Chris, and we pray for Becky, and we pray for all of those, Lord, that are just dealing with some, some health issues, and we just pray that you will be with them, Lord God, to comfort them, heal them, and we just thank you, God, that we can turn to you in all of these times, good times and bad, times of trouble and times of joy. And Lord, we see that you are good because you have just done so many things even before time began, you were there. And that's just mind-boggling to understand. But Lord, you have had everything 
all under your control. And Lord, we especially want to pray for somebody who has done much for this church. We pray for Buzzy Booth, whose son has passed away. And Lord, we just pray for your comfort upon him. We just pray that you will just help him during this time. It's got to be heartbreaking to lose a child, and Lord, I just pray that you will be with him to comfort him and see him through this time of grief. And Lord, we just thank you for all of the goodness you have given us, the joy of children, the joy of grandchildren. Lord, we just thank you for family and friends. And Lord, we pray for this country. We pray that your will be done that the next president of this great United States will be the person you want in that seat. Lord, you have a plan for this country, for this world, and we also know what the Bible says, and that things need to be fulfilled in order for your plan to come together. And there's things that are happening that we don't like, but we know that we can count on you as our rock and our foundation that there are things that will continue to happen, but you're still in control. So we pray for all the elections this year, from local to federal, because Lord, no matter what happens, you're still our God, you're still our rock, you're still our foundation. And Lord, we can count on you when we can't count on anybody else. When at times our family fails us, our friends fail us, our government fails us. But Lord, you said in your word, I will not forsake you or leave you. And Lord, I have found that so many times in my life and in the lives of people I know, that your goodness is all through everything you do, whether we understand it or not. So, Lord, we just pray for this country, and we pray that we would turn our hearts back to you for healing, for reconciliation, and, Lord, so that we can be used to fulfill your plans and your purpose. And we love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you mind taking up the um, offering while you're up here? <clears throat> it is time for our offering. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Anne will take up the offering this morning as Nancy is away. Please rise for the doxology, those who are able. Father, we thank you, for you are a beneficent God, and you have blessed us so wonderfully. And this morning, as we give back a portion of what you have given to us, <clears throat> we pray that it will be used in your will and to your glory here in this church, in the community, and around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You may be seated. Now I'd like the choir to come forward and the girls, if you would like, to sing Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho. <clears throat> Let's put some fun into this. fun with that song up here than all of you back there, down there, except for Sandy. She was having a really good time. <clears throat> Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. That is our theme this morning as we continue to look into revisiting children's Bible stories, sermon time. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for those wonderful stories that we can tell our children that are from the Bible. And we thank you so much that there's so much more to them than what we tell our children, that we can find as adults good messages, good morals, um, and good life lessons in them for ourselves. And so, Lord, as we look today at your word, we pray that you will just fill us with the Spirit and that he will bring us new insight, new understanding into what the words have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we are moving ahead this morning, some 200, uh, 400 rather, and 50 years in the Old Testament from Abraham, we talked about last week. We are jumping forward um, almost half a century, uh, half a millennium. And we're skipping the first five books of the Bible, or the rest of them, um, all the rest of the Torah, which we believe were written by Moses. And we're, we're skipping over the story of Moses and leading the Israelites out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. We're also skipping over um, the story of Abraham, or, or Isaac rather, having Jacob and Esau, the twins, and what happened to them. Uh, Jacob's wrestling match with God, God giving Jacob the name Israel, 
the birth of Jacob's 12 sons who became the 12 nations of Israel. That's where the name Israel came from. And uh, we're skipping over the life of Joseph, which is a very interesting one, where he went from being in prison to a high official in Egypt who saved the nation and the region by overseeing a storage plan for grain which carried the country through a seven-year drought. So where we come to today is Moses has led the people 40, uh, through 40 years wandering in the wilderness and brought them to the border of Canaan across the Jordan River. And there, because God had commanded that he would not be going into the promised land. Of course, by this time he was 120 years old. But that wasn't why he didn't go. He went because he had, um, he had sinned against God. And so this was a punishment to him that he would not actually pass into the promised land. So Moses, on God's direction, turned over leadership of the Israelites to Joshua, who originally had been his aide way back when and had grown to become his second in command in the, among the Israelites. There were two million of them at this point. Over those 400 years in Egypt, they had grown from a small family <coughs> of under 100 to over two million people. So here they were, standing at the edge of the Jordan River, ready to step across into the Promised Land. And the first thing upon entering Canaan that the Israelites had to do was fight a battle with the city of Jericho. Now, certainly Joshua, or anyone in their right mind, did not want to fight a battle with Jericho. Because if ever, ever there was a city that no one would want to attack, it was Jericho. <clears throat> Famous for its powerful army, it was an impenetrable city with walls 13 feet high and five feet thick, completely surrounding the city. Its guard towers rose 28 feet in the air with internal stairs that protected the soldiers as they climbed up and down. And at the top, they had a bird's eye view of the land around the city where they could shoot with accuracy, deadly accuracy, with their arrows and spears, any attackers who came. And in addition, its army was equipped with chariots, which added a nearly unbeatable element to warfare at that time. Moreover, Jericho had a reputation, a long history as a powerful, indestructible city. Archaeologists believe that Jericho was, in fact, one of the first cities ever built around 9,000 BC. They also believe it was the first city to build a protective wall around it, around 8,000 BC. Here is a model of that city with the wall around it. Um, and this is what it probably looked like. So this was not a city that they wanted as their first test upon entering the promised land. And here's a photograph of some of the ruins today of Jericho. But being only a few miles from the Jordan River, this was the first city that the Israelites had to conquer. So let's look at our picture story this morning, which once again I put together using resources from freebibleimages.org. And let's just quickly go through the story of Jericho as it would be presented to a child. Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. Moses told the Israelites that after leading them in the desert for 40 years, he could not lead them into the Promised Land. Joshua would lead them. Be strong and courageous, he said to Joshua. God will go with you and conquer the nations. So Joshua led the Israelites to the banks of the Jordan River. The promised land was just on the other side. And on the other side of the river was Jericho. 
the first city the Israelites would have to conquer. The people of Jericho were evil, and God wanted them defeated. But it was a walled city with many soldiers. How could the Israelites conquer it? When the Israelites were near Jericho, Joshua saw a man with a sword. He asked, are you for us or our enemies? The man said, neither. I am commander of the Lord's army. Joshua fell face down in reverence. The man said, take off your sandals. The place you are standing is holy. The soldiers of Jericho shut the gates when they heard the Israelites were coming, having already heard of their God. But instead of changing their ways, they got ready for war. Then the Lord said to Joshua, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. March armed men around the city each day and have seven priests carry horns in front of the holy ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the horns. Have the whole army give a loud shout and the city walls will collapse. So for six days, the priests march around the city. And each day, the priests blew their horns. On the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. <clears throat> then the priests blew their horns, and all the army men yelled at once. And the city's walls collapsed. The Israelite army charged into the city and took it. They destroyed every living thing in it. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. With our 21st century mindset, we cringe at this kind of a massacre of a whole city of men and women and children <clears throat> and even animals, and especially when it was commanded by God. Joshua 6.21 says, they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle and sheep and donkeys. But as we've talked about before, we need to consider this story within the context of its time and its culture. Jericho was not simply in the way of the Israelites. It wasn't something they just had to get through to go on to the next level, the next place to take over the promised land. This was a city of evil, like the world that Noah was in. In fact, all of the Canaanite nations were evil. How evil were they? Not only did they worship false gods, but they followed such ungodly pra practices as temple prostitution and human sacrifice, even sacrificing their own children to their false gods. But why kill the animals? God wanted to fully protect the Israelites from being influenced by the culture of Jericho. He wanted nothing left that could possibly infect the Israelites with the city's depravity. So he told Joshua that the Israelites were to take no spoils of war, including the animals. And while they could take valuables such as gold and silver, all of those were to become part of the Lord's treasury for the tabernacle, not individually for any person. Joshua 6.24 says, then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. This is one of the lessons of this story. Protect yourself from sinful contamination by your culture, by those around you who live a different lifestyle that to God is sinful, I check out the news online every night. And much of it these days is not really news. 
Much of it is, quote, lifestyle news or social news. Much of it is just pulling stuff off of, off of X or off of Instagram and just putting it out as a news story almost. Well, I was looking through the other night and I saw a headline in the New York Times that read, I was content with monogamy. I shouldn't have been. So I was curious. Actually, I didn't read it at the time. But after, when I was writing this sermon, I decided to go back and check it out, because it might work as an illustration. And it turns out that this was written by a man who, who um, met his wife in Bible college. They were both Christians. And he had gone on to seminary. And he was near to finishing seminary when his wife suggested that maybe they should try a little experimentation with other people. So they decided they would try out polyamory, which is having sexual relationships with multiple people, sometimes being married or in partnership relationships with a number of people. They decided to give that a try. And according to the article, she eventually became an atheist bisexual. And he fell in love with another woman while they were still married and having these outside relationships. And he divorced his wife and married the other woman. Now, it doesn't say in the article what happened to his faith, but you get a very strong impression that that faith doesn't exist anymore. God does not want us to fall into such temptations. And they are temptations. He did not want his chosen people who were still in their spiritual infancy as a nation at that time to fall into the temptations of the depraved culture of the people of Jericho. And so he had the warriors of the Israelites destroy all that was inside the city of Jericho. Another lesson of this story is found at the beginning of the Lord's command to Joshua about how to defeat the city. The first thing the Lord said was, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. Now that's really interesting because the battle hadn't been fought yet. And yet God is saying, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. God's telling Joshua that the outcome is already determined. It's already happened, even before it happens. This is true in our lives as well. If we listen to God, if we do as he says, rather than follow our own desires, our own passions, our own will, if we listen to God and follow him, then the outcome is already set. We will succeed at whatever he tells us to do. Years ago, when I was doing my traveling ministry, music ministry all up and down the East Coast, it became clear to me that God wanted me to purchase an RV, a small RV, to sleep in behind churches. Um, when we had concerts or worship services. And I liked the idea. So I diligently set out to find myself a small RV. I hunted at every RV place in Central Mass. I looked at all the online RV want ads. I went all over the place trying out different RVs. And I found nothing. Nothing that would serve the purpose, nothing that was in good enough condition, nothing that I could afford. Now, one day I was out in, in the field across the street from my house playing um, with a stick with my dog, playing fetch. And every time I'd throw that stick, my golden retriever would run back and I'd take the stick and he wouldn't let go. He'd turn it into a game of tug-of-war. 
And he'd be tugging at that stick. And he did this time after time. I had to pry his mouth open to get his, the stick out and throw it again. And finally, he came back and exasperated. I said, if you don't let go of the stick, I can't throw it. And it suddenly hit me. For God, I wasn't letting go of the stick. I was searching for this little RV, the perfect little RV that I could afford and couldn't find it. God had a plan. And I was undoing his plan because I was so determined that I was going to be in control of it instead of waiting on him to bring it about. So I said, Lord, it's in your hands. I give up. I've failed anyway, so I might as well give up. Well, a few days later, I was driving up Route 119 in Ringe, New Hampshire, just on, I don't remember what I was doing, but I wasn't hunting for an RV, when all of a sudden it occurred to me that in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, I remembered seeing a little RV place on the side of Route 202. So I hung a right onto Route 202, and I went right up there. And as I pulled into that dealership, there was the most beautiful little, my favorite color, burgundy, small RV at a price I could afford, inside all redone, just a beautiful little vehicle. God wants to provide for us. He wants to provide for us materially, but he also even more wants to provide for us spiritually. He provided for the Israelites spiritually when they destroyed Jericho. Because Jericho provided or presented possible temptations that could draw them away from God. And if you read a little, story, a little further in the story, which we're not going to do, you'll find out that one of the Israelites, in fact, took a couple of the golden idols and buried them in his tent, and it brought disarray and problems onto the Israelites because one person was selfish and decided to take matters into his own hands without, without trusting God to provide for him. So that's what God's order to take no spoils did. It eliminated potential sources of conflict between the Israelites and it eliminated these temptations that the city of Jericho presented. The Bible tells us, <clears throat> for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say for the love of money, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, but it says all kinds of evil. And then the Bible also, Jesus told us, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Finally, the story about the Battle of Jericho shows God's infinite power. The Israelites did nothing to knock down the walls of the city. Blowing some horns and yelling at the top of your voice is not going to knock down a stone wall that has been there for hundreds of years and withstood everything that came at it. God did it all by himself. He needed no human action to destroy Jericho. He was perfectly capable of, capable of doing it all by himself. For centuries, people... Many people contended that the story of Jericho, like many of the stories in the Bible, was a myth with no proof. And how could it possibly happen? How could that possibly happen? And then in 1868, archaeologists discovered the traces of an ancient city in the Jordan River Valley. And over the following decades, as they began their archaeological digs, it revealed the great walls of Jericho. And it clearly showed that they had crumbled and fallen. And not crumbled and fallen over time, 
a stone here, a stone there. They had crumbled and fallen all at once, just collapsed into the city. Further studies determined that the city had been built on a fault line. And scientific determination, however they do that, had determined that there was indeed an earthquake within that century of the Jericho attack. God uses nature to effect his punishments, his control, his purposes. That was in the same century that the Bible says the city's walls fell down. Now in addition, in going through the ruins, they have discovered that the city was burned to the ground. And they also discovered buried food caches that had obviously been put into the ground for the, in case there was a siege. The people of Jericho knew the Israelites were coming. They had camped for months across the Jordan River. There was no secret that this huge army was coming for them. And so they had prepared these food caches in case there was a siege, because sieges could last, well, we know the siege of, of, uh, in, in Israel with the Assyrians lasted over three years. So they can last and last. People ended up eating their own children in that case, like the Donald, Donaldson or whatever that is, crossing the Rocky Mountains. But interestingly, these caches still had the food intact. Nobody had been able to get to it to take the food out. There was no need, because when that battle was won, it was won instantly. With God knocking those walls down to the ground. We see today more and more proof of the Bible's validity as archaeological work continues. For example, scholars have long contended that Moses could not have written the first five books of the Bible. It's totally impossible because there was no written language. What was he going to write with? How could he? And so the first five books of the Bible were handed down verbally. And of course, verbally, orally, everything changes. Well, in the last few years, they've discovered a number of locations with an early Semitic language that dates all the way back to when Moses, before Moses lived in Egypt. And they have found it not only in Egypt, but they found it in the wilderness where the Israelites wandered for all those years. So there was a language that Moses could use to write it all down. There also had been doubt for many, many years that King David was real. But just recently, in the 1990s, a stone slab was discovered in Jerusalem with the words, Kingdom of David. And since then, the city of David has been discovered under a small neighborhood in Jerusalem, just a little distance from the Temple Mount, and they have found all kinds of artifacts and pottery and such things to prove that this indeed was a, was a city at the time of when David lived as king, and that it was much larger than scholars have said it could have been at that time. It's impossible, right, that the walls of Jericho would collapse at the sounding of a horn and the yelling of soldiers. Impossible. But the faith of believers in the veracity of the Bible and now archaeological evidence support that Bible narrative, give proof to Jesus' statement in Luke 18:27. What is impossible for man is possible for God. The story of Jericho teaches us to believe the Bible as God's 
infallible and inerrant word, breathed by God into the writers of all of those books and stories. It teaches us to trust in God, to give him our hearts, to listen for his commands, like buy an RV, to live a life devoted to loving him, honoring him, obeying him, and serving him. And if we do that, and if we are willing to wait on him until he is ready to bring those things into our lives, it will happen. Because God said so. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for these stories. And we thank you that it's so clear that they relate to us and that we must change our lives in such a way that we conform to them, that we trust you, that we devote ourselves to you, honor and obey you, and that we serve you. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you this morning and we just pray that that you will help us with all of those things because we are still human and we still fail. We still fall short, as Paul said. We thank you that you cleanse us each time we do. And we thank you that you have a purpose in mind for each one of us. We pray that you will help each one of us to achieve that purpose. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And now our final song is the battle belongs to the Lord. And I guess we prove that in the story of Jericho. Therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And now go from here, carrying the love and the peace of Jesus in your hearts and sharing it with all whom you meet. We pray this in his holy name. Amen.